Good evening. What gives life meaning? It's a quest that we all share, and I'm going to take you on a personal journey of myself pursuing that, that ambition. Um, well, I started my career, in fact, my whole career has been basically going places, doing things, and then writing about them in magazines. And I started off with uh, writing about skiing, but I would take the skiing to places that was a little different from where normal, I mean, where most people went. And it's something that you needed to have kind of a climber's mentality to look at. And the climber's mentality is one where you look at a line and a face, and then you figure out how you could possibly get up it. And sometimes the blanker it seems, the more challenging it is to find the way to, to ferret your way up it. And that gives a lot of uh, meaning to us. And then those of us who are passionate about it, we tend to want to push it a little further, which is to go to places that nobody else has been before in order to really explore, in order to really find our own way. And so go to a place like the Grand Canyon. Here, she's pointing out the line that you see here that uh, was about a 1,000 meter um, vertical route that nobody would ever climbed anything near here before. As far as I know, nobody thought about it before. But it just attracted me on a previous hike into the canyon. And I've taken this to you know, further, more exotic places like Tibet on the photo on the left where nobody had even been into, I mean, no climbers had been into this mountain range before. There were Tibetans living there. And to Bolivia on the right where nobody would skied on the glaciers there before. It just gives it more, uh, more meaning, more interest to a climber. And so I would take um, slideshows onto the road in the States and uh, write about it in magazines. But it really, it was all very personally meaningful, but I love this title of this book by Lionel Torre, The Conquistadors of the Useless, because it really is useless to anyone else except for the person who's actually doing it, who finds something in it. And so when I was writing more, it's, I wanted to go a little deeper, and so I wanted to think about, I mean, write about the things that I was actually thinking about myself, too, which is a family and my origins in climbing. This is my dad there in the telecabine going up above Les Ains, and here he is above Chamonix, just nearby. His passion was doing new routes. And so that's what ended up leading us to Les Ains in the early 60s. And uh, my mother became the director of the science department here at LAS. That's the only building um, that they had at the time. And dad was the athletics director. And I would go off climbing with him whenever possible and ski with the, with the racers of the um, LAS team. I was about half their age and size, but it still was just magnificent for me. This was heaven, being in Les Ains. Meanwhile, Dad would uh, go off on his climbing trips and had some big ambitions that way until one day he didn't come back. And um, so we, he had become rather well known as a climber by then. And um, there was even a book written about him when you know, he was 30 years old. And which is the age that he died. And um, so I always had this, this sort of legend like, um, as a father that I grew up with. And as I went into the climbing world, it became stronger and stronger, sort of measure of comparison in some ways. But you know, um, I would recognize the, the absence of my father. And I started writing about that in my magazine articles, like this story for Backpacker, where I was assigned to do a hike around uh, Mount St. Helens, which is a volcano in the Northwest. And so what do you say about putting one foot in front of the other? So I started writing about Dad and comparing Dad to the volcano and his personality and, and how we uh, differed that way. And I just had a baby daughter just recently. I mean, it was before this hike, and so I was thinking about how her life would go and uh, you know, the 
dance between you know, ambition and family, and there's a lot of trade-offs that you have to do. How do you blend these? It was something I was thinking about a lot. But this, this journey um, led me to do eventually to the one mountain that I always felt that I had to climb, which was the Eiger, the mountain that Dad died on. And as it turned out, just by quirks of fate, um, they ended up making a movie of me doing this. And so well, you're about to see the 90-second uh, uh, trailer to that movie that captures the spirit of it quite well. I don't know, it just speaks to my, to my soul, to my heart, to be in this environment. Since he was nine years old, John Harlan has feared the Eiger, the mountain that took his father's life. Forty years later, he's about to confront the mountain that haunts his dreams. It's a dangerous face, but John cares very much that his daughter grows up with him. At different points of the climb, he's going to be thinking about his dad. And I think when he reaches the point where his, uh, where his father fell, um, that is going to be a very emotional moment for him. So climbing the, the peak is what I really expected to bring me closest to my father and to really build that, that missing connection. But as it turns out, it was actually writing the book um, that did it, because that's where I could really um, go, go into his personality and, and all the things that I learned about him in the process, and sometimes when I'd be typing at the keyboard, I'd just pause and just be crying into it for all the things that he'd missed out on afterwards. So the next year, I went off on my biggest adventure of all, which was uh, going around this small country that we're in here, which um, doing it completely under muscle power takes some time. And so I left, started off from Les Aires and hiked over to the border. And then in just a few days, it got pretty real up there. The peaks were high above Chamonix. And then I was climbing and grabbed a um, rock and it came off and I went down a long ways and broke a bunch of bones in my feet. And so I couldn't continue the, the journey right away, but you can see in the pictures here the, the daily photo posts that I'd been putting up. And obviously the rest of Switzerland is much bigger and, and I can't let a little setback uh, stop you from, from your journey. And this had been a dream of mine for a long time. So I, came, I just came up with a new plan, which was instead of doing it all at once in the 100 days that I was after, I would um, come back for a month and the end of the summer after my feet had healed up well enough for some mild walking. And I would paddle the, the rivers, the Rhine, and the lakes up there on the northern boundary, and then mountain bike the Jura, and then paddle back to uh, to Les Aines on Lake Geneva. So I did that, and wherever the water followed the border, I would paddle and then take a bike to follow the, the border when water wasn't there. Until finally, I was back here in Lake Geneva and uh, completed that, that northern segment. But for, for me, just you know, personally, as somebody who enjoys adventures, is that every day was interesting, and it was solving problems, and it was gorgeous country, and and I really loved it, but I, I wanted something more out of this, and I was writing every day about it, and so the real purpose, other than my having a good time, was to try to figure out why the borders were where they are. Um, and things like this, for example, this is a border stone. You can tell this is the, the French border, and that farm down there is just 
barely on the Swiss side of the border. Well, imagine through history, through World War I, World War II, and previous centuries, what a difference it made being on one side of that border versus the other. Uh, I stayed in a tent for mo most of the, the trip and would stay in huts when they were along the border, conveniently enough, placed, and eventually closed the circle. Well, came back to Les Ains, had accumulated quite a few Facebook followers by then, and discovered that Mark Twain was right. Switzerland really is a big place, if only you ironed it flat. And uh, by way of illustration, if you see the, the lower, darker green triangle, that would be like hiking from the sea to the summit of Everest and back down again. And the light triangle is the one that I did along the, the border. And it was about the equivalent of going from the sea to the summit of Everest and back down every week. So I would give some, I gave some talks about this, and, and one of these um, talks brought me back here to um, Les Ains. And so I was back home again, as places always felt more like home than anywhere else. And I was very fortunate after that talk, I, my daughter Sienna was offered a scholarship for her senior year here. And so here you see her on the, the left on that mountain, St. Helens, that I wrote about earlier, and then graduating here, which was just an amazing thing for our family to have this happen. And then that ended up leading to my being offered a, a job here, which was uh, also phenomenally um, amazing for me. Uh, because now with the Alpine Institute, what the job is, is basically to inspire in young people the same passions that I have and take them a little further, as you'll see. Um, so we are taking through the Alpine Club, we're taking uh, kids out to the different peaks around, these identified peaks or some of the skyline peaks, and we're trying to uh, explore most of these local peaks and giving kids an experience that they mostly have not had back home in this most amazing place in the world to, to do it. But the most important thing for me is this inspiring the sense of curiosity. And so their eyes are opening to the wonder of, of nature and our Earth. And the ultimate example of curiosity is science. It's understanding why the Earth is how it is. And how to protect it. And I've generally only talked about my father and relationship with my father, but really it's my mother who's been my greatest inspiration and who's always been there for me. And she was a, a scientist and a marine biologist. And so that was actually always my goal as a, as a youth was, and all the way through college, was to become a scientist, an Arctic uh, biologist, and then climbing ended up getting in the way and distracting me. But on my trip around uh, Switzerland, I would see a lot of things and uh, certainly saw the glacier change, uh, changes that have happened. You can see how much it's retreated recently and glaciers are the real indicator of uh, the climate change that's happening. And so here in Les Ains, one of the things we've done is to set up these plots at different altitudes from the valley down below to the summit of the Tour d'Ai, and we'll be monitoring these plots scientifically, um, measuring things, we're consulting with local scientists, and it's something that as the school institutionalizes it, the school is going to be here long after I am, any of the students, any of the existing faculty, so if the study continues, it can be a really good long-term climate research study um, just because it's been institutionalized at an, a welcoming school like this. And so the students go out, we're measuring trees, and uh, including one of our um, things that we're doing is looking for the highest examples of, of species because like this tree in the upper photo there is uh, the highest tree we can find on Tuldai. And as the climate warms, the tree line is going to be going up, so we can be monitoring that happening by always looking for the highest trees. And on the Alpine Club trips, I noticed that the most popular trips were to the glaciers around here. We're very lucky and we have some glaciers very nearby. And so 
it um, occurred to me to set up a glacier studies program where we can look at these glaciers within an hour of leaving campus. We can be on a glacier here without even breaking a sweat. You see in the background of uh, the plots around Les Ains, and so these are the glaciers um, that are closest to us right here on the Diableray. And just this last week, we had our first uh, field trip up there, and we're measuring this, this hole in a crevasse-like um, place. And so this science-based mindset is what the kids are going to have to learn in order to figure out how to deal with the world's greatest problem, long-term problem, which is the, the changing climate that we have, and how to adapt to it, how to help stop it from happening. That's it's scientific thinking that's going to take us there. So in past slideshows, I've always ended with family and, and the, the connections between the generations in my family. But now, I really feel like I have this extended family um, here at LAS. This is in the cave just above here. And I just, this, seeing the sense of wonder and um, inspiring the kids with the same wonder, the adventure that I felt as a youth here is just really moving to me. And the, it's also an inspiration because the kids here come from a class of a, a stratus in society that really is going to give them an outside, uh, outsized role when they get back to their home countries. So any inf influence that we have on them here at LAS is something that uh, is going to go places in the world. Uh, we, it just makes it so more powerful for me because I think there's a magnifying influence from the students here. And so it feels like I've really finally found the, the ultimate meaning for me, which is to, be inspire, to help to inspire young people into this love for the one earth that we're ever going to have and to inspire in them a science-based mindset that's going to help us solve its problems. Thank you very much.